So we start with the greeting, and the words that you need to read are yellow on the screen. So grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Thank you. Welcome to everybody here in church and to everybody who is watching online. Um, it's the 19th Sunday after Trinity, and the readings will be in our Bibles, in the pews, and on the screen. Uh, we will continue to wear our face masks um, as we meet and sing so that everyone will feel safe. And we especially welcome our guest preacher, Graham Shaw, who's going to talk to us later. Um, and also during communion, uh, we will ask you to sing, finally. So it will save my voice and your ears. <laughs> So I'm hoping to hear some fantastic singing at communion when we get to it, okay. We will help you, um, the three of us will help you, but um, I'm sure you'll do a grand job. So, we come to our first hymn, and it's a great hymn of promise for those who trust and obey. His promise that when we walk with him, he sheds light on our way, drives the clouds away with his smile, and if we trust and obey, we need not fear, sigh, or cry. So please, let's stand to sing. Please sit or kneel for the prayer of preparation. And we say together the words on the screen. 
Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now the collect for the 19th Sunday after Trinity. Faithful Lord, whose steadfast love never ceases, and whose mercy never comes to an end. Grant us the grace to trust you and to receive the gifts of your love, new every morning, in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So we remain seated as Phil comes to read our first lesson. The reading, first reading this morning is from Hebrews chapter 4, reading verses 12 to the end, and you will find this on page 1203 of your Pew Bibles. For the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. This is the word of the Lord. So we come to our next hymn and it's a reminder that we need to look to God in all things and we ask him to grant us wisdom, grant us courage, free us from the fears that have long bound us, our selfishness, our self-control, and all the evil that tempts us. God of grace and God of glory. Let's stand to sing.
And if you want to follow it in your pew Bibles, it's uh, from Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 to 31. And it's on page 1014. Mark 10, 17 to 31. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honour your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I've kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go, sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. At this the man fell face, face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible with God. Peter said to him, We've left everything to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied. No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, and with them persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. Please do take a seat. Well, it's really good that we're joined today by Graham. Um, Graham and I have known each other for about 12 years. In fact, um, he used to be my boss back in Swanage um, when we ministered together in Swanage Methodist Church. And I was a children's worker and Graham was the minister there. Um, and you've since moved to Devon, haven't you? So I thought it'd be good if we just got to know a few things about you before we start. Sure. Um, so, have you always lived by the seaside in nice picturesque places? Um, Tom, no, I haven't. Um, this is uh, not my home so much because I was actually born in Africa. I, I was born in uh, Zimbabwe and I uh, grew up there. And, uh, and then was sent back by the, by the church to serve in Zambia, uh, Zambia, yes, and also in Zimbabwe. So, um, this is not uh, typical, uh, a typical place for, us, for me to be. Uh, it's really good that you're, you're with us today. That sounds, you. sounds like you must have had quite a journey when you were in Zimbabwe. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey as a minister? Surely. Um, Tom, uh, it, it's a very different situation, as, as, as I'm sure you can all imagine. Um, and the country has been... It, it is a beautiful country, and they are a beautiful people. But they have been afflicted uh, with a, a, a corrupt government, which has caused no end of suffering. And so the servants of God uh, have a real challenge in front of them. And those who respond faithfully, I think, to God's call are standing there with the, with the victims. Uh, and, and it was my privilege to, to work alongside people who were constantly inspiring me by what they were prepared to give and what they were prepared to risk, actually, uh, for the sake of the gospel. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. And now that you're in retirement, I know as a fact that you, you're not just sort of sitting down and putting your feet up. I mean, that's shown by the fact that you've travelled all the way from Devon to Trowbridge to visit us today. Um, what else are you doing in your um, retirement? 
Well, thank you. Yes, it was good to retire and, and to be able to do a bit of travel and to spend more time with the family. That was a great joy. Um, but uh, I continue to preach, and I'm very blessed in that. And I'm very blessed to be here this morning uh, with, with all of you folk. Uh, but also, um, I'm a trustee of a, a Christian uh, trust, which is continuing relief work uh, in Zimbabwe. And not only uh, relief uh, food for people who are desperately hungry, but also the bread of life uh, through the word of God that is proclaimed uh, among them very powerfully. And so it's a great privilege to sort of carry forward that work. There's a lot of work involved, but then there are a lot of uh, very fine Christian folk in this country who want to engage with that and who might see that as a part of their mission. Yeah, thank you, and I'm sure we can send out the link to the website so people can read and get thank a bit you. more details. Um, I'll send that over to you, Dillis, for next week's email. Well, Graham, before you give us our sermon and before you help us to explore what that quite difficult passage of the Bible means, um, shall I pray for you? Please do, Tom. Let's pray together, shall we? Loving God, we thank you that you've sent Graham to be with us today to help us to explore what your word says and what your word means to us today. And so we thank you for the preparation that Graham has put into today. And we pray, Lord, that now you'll bless the words he says and you'll give us ears to listen and you'll give Graham the spirit of understanding what you're saying to him today. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Graham. Thanks very much, Tom. Thank you, and thank you for your invitation to come here uh, this morning and share in, in your worship. I would like to be able to claim some uh, credit for the fact that uh, Swanage Methodist Church, where Tom came and joined us, was his first appointment as a children's and youth worker. I like to think that uh, perhaps we had something to do with the training, but I have to tell you there's nothing of the sort. Actually, it was what Tom taught us uh, in that job, and uh, that was a, a very blessed ministry among us, and I'm sure it's a very blessed ministry here uh, with you. So, we come to uh, a familiar story in the Gospel today, perhaps too familiar in some ways. Uh, but we must not uh, miss the, uh, the stark warning that is given. It's rather like a, a road sign. You know, you're traveling along and you come to a road sign which says, slow down. Uh, the road ahead is a bit bumpy. There are some sharp turns and so on. So beware. So, so with this passage in Mark's Gospel, uh, prepare to be surprised. Prepare even to be disturbed Yes, um, especially, I would say, if you think you have your own Christian faith sorted. And the clue which gives us that warning is there in the reaction, not of the young man who comes to Jesus, and Jesus himself will stand at the center stage, but those who are almost off stage, that is, the disciples. And it is their um, reaction to the teaching of Jesus. Verse 24, the disciples were amazed at his words. Verse 26, they were exceedingly astonished. The disciples, you see, could hardly believe what they were hearing. Jesus was offending what they thought to be the right and proper understanding of the faith and the way that God orders things in his world. And I should say that if they were rocked to their heels, then so also may we be rocked today. So, friends, fasten your safety belt and uh, we go forward. And we plunge into the action here in Mark's Gospel. It's a very fast-moving Gospel, as I'm sure you know. And here we join it as Jesus and the disciples are on a journey and we know that that journey is leading to Jerusalem and, for Jesus, the cross. And on the way, a young man uh, comes to Jesus and falls at his feet and asks this question. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, for those people, and at that time, the meaning of his words would have been crystal clear. 
but for us, maybe not so clear and uh, perhaps need a little bit of unpacking. So, it's Tom Wright that I turn to here again, the, the, the Bible scholar and one of his helpful commentaries. And he points out that for the Jews, time is divided into two. There is the present age, there is the age to come. The present age is a sinful age in which the wicked rule and the righteous are oppressed and there's great suffering. In the age to come, all that is going to be changed because God will then be in control. He will rule and it will be a time of justice and truth and righteousness and peace. And another name for the age to come, of course, uh, we would say is the kingdom of God, God's kingdom. So when you know that, you know that actually the question would be something like this, really, in our terms. The young man was asking, how can I be sure that when the age to come finally arrives, I will be a part of the action. I will be there. He wants to be sure that he is in on God's action. You see, he cares. He has a passion for God's kingdom. He loves God. He wants to see his kingdom of truth and justice and peace take the place of the present chaotic disorder of our world. And isn't that something that we can identify with? Because I know I have that same passion. And so, asking what he must do to inherit eternal life, we would probably best understand by, well, it's not, I should say, it is not asking Jesus, can you guarantee me my personal place in heaven? No. Rather than that, he wants to be a part of God's action plan to bring in this new world order. And again, isn't that something that we can identify with? Do we not long for a world of peace where injustice and oppression and violence are ended? Corruption is exposed, evildoers are brought to justice, where compassion is shown to the poor and the vulnerable of our world? We call this new world order the kingdom of God. And surely we long for that kingdom and pray for that kingdom and struggle for that kingdom and work to see this kingdom come in all its fullness. Now when we know that this was behind the young man's question, well then I find... I can really warm to him in the same way that Jesus did in the story. We're told that Jesus looked at him and loved him. So where is this young man to begin? Well, Jesus takes him to the Ten Commandments and there really is no surprise there because surely if you want to seek God's way, if you're seeking God's way, the first thing to do is to turn to God's word there in the scriptures. So this young man is able to say very quickly, well, he's on sides for that. He's able to say, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. That's good. But now here is the surprise coming. Here is the new thing in Jesus' teaching. This is where the road gets a bit bumpy. This is where some people who think they have their faith all sorted become a little bit disturbed. The disciples, obviously, were among them. The triumph of the kingdom of God over this rebellious world, this 
disorder, this unhappy world, is not something we do ourselves. No. What must I do, asks the young man, and strictly speaking, the answer to his question would be nothing. Because there is nothing that you can do that will helpfully, uh, that will help the situation on. There is nothing that you can do alone. And this is a, a difficult truth for us to grasp, I think. It's not up to us alone to put this world to rights. We may try, and many do, and fail. Ultimately, it is God's work. This is something that he does, and only he can do. And of course, something that he was already doing there in the life of Jesus. Engaging with the powers of darkness. Confronting the sin that enslaves men and women in our world. Struggling mightily against Satan's stronghold. Not alone, but in the power of the Spirit and in obedience to the Heavenly Father. And we know that the final epic battle would take place upon the cross. And there, the evil one would be defeated once and for all. The cross and Jesus' glorious resurrection are the mark of that epic victory. A victory of good over evil, truth over the lie, light over darkness, and life over death. God's kingdom is victorious. His sovereign rule is established and Jesus is king. So, the new creation is already breaking in upon this world. The age to come, as the Jews call it, the kingdom of God is already here. And it is God's doing and not ours. But by the grace of God, and not because of anything that we have done or because we're particularly good at it, but we are invited to share in that cosmic victory that has already been won for us. God graciously invites us to take our place in his kingdom and forgives us our own sin. And then invites us to become his partners in rolling back the epic victory that he has already won over death and rolling that victory out in our world and in every facet of our life here in this world. And we could say towards that great and glorious day when, as we read in the book of Revelation, the cry, um, the cry goes out in heaven the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever. Hallelujah. Yes, and as junior partners with Jesus, the part that we have been graciously assigned with him, it starts in grace, and it is always of grace, by grace. By grace alone that we are invited into the kingdom and our sins forgiven. So that whatever we may be able to do in the kingdom and for the kingdom is by grace and by grace alone. It's not me and my way and what I think is best, nor is it your way. It is Jesus and his way. It's not in my strength not in your strength, but in his. It's not what I am doing for God in my life, but what he is already doing in my life by his grace. So my part and your part 
is but to humbly receive the grace that he longs to pour out upon us and that we might receive that grace to first surrender to him and then we might become channels of his grace to uh, a world that is still tragically dominated by what the, the Christian writer Philip Yancey calls ungrace. That is everything that stands in opposition to God's kingdom of truth and righteousness. What is required of us then? That we trust God with our very lives. That we depend on no other security than God himself. Back to the story of Jesus and the young man who meet on the, on the road to Jerusalem. Now will this young man surrender to God's grace? And will he completely trust himself to the loving Father? Jesus loves him. We've been told that. Jesus must have longed that this young man who showed such tremendous potential would join the disciples on the journey up towards Jerusalem. His potential in the kingdom must have been great. But you see, Jesus discerned something else as well. You lack one thing, he says. You lack one thing. What could that possibly be? What could that possibly be? Because this young man seems to have the world at his feet already. He has a good upbringing, a good education. He has youth and vitality. He has a passion for God and for God's kingdom. Isn't that enough? Go, says Jesus, sell all you have and give to the poor. And then you will have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. And we read, disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. As Jesus had already discerned, it was his great possessions which were standing in the way. His wealth had become his security. I imagine that he longed to be set free so that he could follow his passion for the kingdom of God. But he could not quite bring himself to step aside from his own wealth. He was not yet ready to entrust his whole life into the hands of the Heavenly Father. Jesus showed him what he needed to do to break free from the hold that money had upon his life. But he couldn't quite bring himself to do that. I wonder if we had been present there at that time and if we could have read the thoughts of this young man as he was thinking, what might those thoughts have been? I imagine that they would have been something like this. He would be saying to himself, yes, I do love God. Yes, I do. I do truly seek his kingdom. Yes, and I do trust God. Up to a point. Up to a point. But to accept God as my only security? And we read that he walked away sorrowfully. And we notice also that Jesus did not go running down the road after him, did not suggest to him that there was perhaps an easier way than that into the kingdom. Because there was not. And there is not. So friends, where does this leave you and me today? I think we've got to guard against the danger of putting a distance between ourselves and that young man. We could easily do that because we could think, well, I'm not particularly wealthy. Um, and um, nor do I have great uh, influence. No. Some of us would also have to say, and nor do I exactly have youth on my side. No. But you see, this account has been included in the gospel for a reason. It is a part of God's word to us 
and to all of us today. So we must let God speak to us and to our situation through his word. Ask yourself, if you were standing before Jesus right now and he said these words to you, one thing you lack, what might that thing be? Is there something that is keeping you back from playing your full part in the kingdom? What might it be? And remember, it may not be money. It could be something else in your case that is preventing you from putting your whole trust in God, making him your first security and your last security. Yes. Something else that you cling to, perhaps. A relationship? Or the good opinion that someone else holds of you and that's very important to you? Or perhaps a target that you've set yourself in life and you're not going to give that up? Whatever it is, it prevents you from receiving the grace of God, the grace that he longs to pour out upon you in order that you might become a channel of that grace to others. I don't know about you, but I am always being inspired in my walk with God by the stories of the great heroes of the faith. Men and women of every age who, when called by God, have taken him at his word and they have trusted God come what may. It's right there in the Bible and throughout the Bible. Remember Abraham called in his old age, mind you, to leave comfort and security and the status that he enjoys in Haran and set out on a journey that leads he knows not where. Or Moses, who is now very comfortably settled in the land of Midian and contentedly tending the flock of his father-in-law and suddenly his very pleasant daydreaming is interrupted by the Holy One of Israel who speaks to him out of a burning bush and commands him to return to Egypt. Egypt, the place in which he is a, a wanted man for a murder that he committed, yes, and to do nothing less than appear before the mighty Pharaoh and demand that he let his people go. Well, we know from the story that Moses didn't exactly jump at <laughs> that um, opportunity. He took some convincing. He needed to be assured. But he did go. And on through the Bible. The list of the heroes of the faith the author of Hebrews lists them, or some of them, and then he says, Time would fail me to tell you of them all. Those who, through faith, conquered kingdoms, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong in their weakness. The heroes of their faith. We know some of them of later years, do we not? Of our, even of our own time. Those men and women whom we say are prepared to jump, believing that the net will appear when it is not yet there. We have read, I'm sure, some of their stories and we're inspired by them. And just occasionally in life, we have the huge privilege of actually meeting one of these heroes of the faith in our own walk like the dear brother in Christ and very close friend of mine whom I was able to work alongside in Zimbabwe for a number of years and then to continue working together when I was here and he was there through a Christian charity supporting that work Pastor Albert Chatindo 
He died tragically just a few days ago, much too young. But his body worn down, worn out, quite literally, through his self-giving life among the poorest of the poor in that beautiful land amidst all that suffering. I wish there was time to share with you today something of his story. I'm sure you know stories that you could share with us, each one of you. The men and women who have inspired you on your walk may even have helped to shape your life. Those men and women in whom we have seen the trademark of the kingdom, which is a willingness to put all other securities aside and trust in God and God alone. So I'm going to close this morning not by telling you a story of one of the heroes of the faith. There isn't time for that. But sharing the words of one of those heroes of the faith. A man called Peter Story, who was an outstanding Christian leader through the dark days of apartheid in South Africa. And he wrote, and I'm going to quote from something that he wrote after the miracle in South Africa, that is the miracle by which that terrible suffering was ended, and it was ended without huge bloodshed across the whole country. Peter Story writes these words, the miracle that South African Christians have to proclaim is not the story of their faithfulness. It is the wonder of a God who could use even such a feeble witness so powerfully. He continues, Frail though our witness was, now that our ordeal is over, we owe it to others to tell them, when your time of testing comes, please remember, that we have a great God. Please trust this great God more faithfully, more fearlessly than we did. And I like that. You see, it's not first and foremost about our faithfulness, is it? And that is really just as well. No. It is about our awesome God who can use our feeble witness so powerfully. And it is about our trusting him, come what may. Amen. So let's stand to declare our faith in the words of the Creed. So we say together, We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, 
who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So please sit or kneel as Kath comes to lead our prayers. Let us pray for the church and the world, and let us thank God for his goodness. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that as followers of our faith, readers of the Bible, and recipients of your love and goodness daily, we know this to be true. So forgive us, Lord, if we sometimes doubt. It seems that we live in a wicked world, where unkindness takes precedent over a soft word, where every day we hear or see via the media acts of violence and inhumanity, when we are filled with despair and fear for the safety of our family and our friends. But help us to remember that we can carry everything to you in prayer. If we call on you, you will hear us. If we seek you, we will find you. And if we knock, the door will be open to us. We thank you, Lord, for the beautiful world, never better than in autumn, when the array of colours is magnificent. Help us to take care of the world for future generations, for our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. And we thank you, Lord, for the enthusiasm and forethought of younger generations that they are showing. And we pray for the success of the coming um, Climate Change Convention in Scotland. May hearts be opened and a willingness to listen to the experts be evident. We pray that the preservation of your beautiful world will be number one priority. Please, Lord, hear our prayer. Thank you for all the good things that have happened this week. We thank you for the lovely MU service we had on Wednesday, the fellowship, love and the friendship we shared with each other as we met again in the hall, for the money we raised at our tech auction to send underprivileged children on holiday again. Thank you, Lord, for all the remarkable things that we do when we work together. Small acts of kindness done with great love. Lord, we know that we are all um, praying for a new leader to steer our two churches for the next few years. We have not only got lovely buildings, but a wonderful, welcoming body of people, open and loving to all. You know just what we need to move us forward. We thank you, Lord, for Tom and his team, for Richard and Barbara and their team of deputies, and for our leaders, uh, for the group of leaders of groups, and to Dillis for our church administrator, and particularly to Richard, our Reverend Richard, who is always there to advise and help and fill in. We are fortunate, and we bless you, Lord, for their work. Help us always to pray with hope, faith, and expectation that the right person will be found for our church. Living Lord, we pray for those in our church family and in the community who are sick in mind, body and spirit, and for those who mourn and need comfort. We think particularly of the family of Colin Forsyth and Glenn Greenaway. Please make your presence felt by anyone who needs your love, and let them know that they can carry everything to God in prayer. And in a moment of silence, we bring to you those known only to ourselves. Finally, Lord, we bring to you the world, its many, many areas of conflict. The people of the world, and many of whom suffer from their faith, let us always remember to pray for them 
to him to pray for peace, for we know that prayer changes things. Bless, O Lord, our country and its many problems. Imbue our leaders with compassion and thought for the less able and the less privileged. We are all equal in your sight, Lord, and we know that you love us with a perfect love. And in the words of a hymn, a song that we sing for the, with the children, our God is a great big God and he holds us in his hand. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you like to stand for the peace? We are all one in Christ Jesus. We belong to him through faith, heirs of the promise of the spirit of peace. Let's offer one another a sign of peace in whatever way you feel is appropriate this morning. It's based on Psalm 46, verse 10, which says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. So let us sing, knowing there is one God who we can trust and who heals us when we ask. Be still and know that I am God. Let's stand to sing. to uh, say our prayer uh, this morning. We've begun again the tradition of bringing up our offering. And for those that uh, have placed their offering in this plate and those who have made their offering in other ways, we're going to pray that prayer so we include all. And so we say together, Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, it is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you our thanks and praise, Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and as we follow his example and obey his command, Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and blood. Who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and we look for the coming of your kingdom. And with this bread and this cup, we make the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Lord. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Accept through him our great High Priest. This our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, Renew us by your Spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power be yours for ever and ever. Amen. We sit together to say the Lord's Prayer. And so we pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. And so draw near with faith to receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your heart by faith, with thanksgiving. Now this morning we have um, something really good to share. We have bread and wine. Now I will explain in a little while when I've been down to uh, Vic uh, what we're going to do, but that is a, a real step forward, isn't it? And we hope after I've explained what we're going to do that you will want to share in both of those gifts.
Now this morning uh, we are going to try this uh, system. We hope it's going to work really well. We'll just have to see and make some adjustments if it doesn't. But I'm pretty confident it's going to be okay. Uh, for bread and wine, we're coming up the middle aisle, as we always have done. We will come around this side, all of us, this side. And we'll come to me at the small table here to receive your bread. If you receive your bread and wish to receive wine, then you will go on behind me and go to the small table, which is up by the communion rail, where Richard will be with this flagon, uh, and he will pour into a small cup like this your wine. You will drink it and place it into the receptacle, which is either side of the chancel. If you've come up from this side of the church, this way, and up to here, you will go round to the left when you come back via the organ. If you come up from that side of the church and you go up, you will receive your wine and you will go that way. If you go through the Duke Chapel, out through there, past the desk here and back down the side aisle, and we will all go in that flowing manner. Is that okay? That's clear? Good. Excellent. We also have non-alcoholic wine. If you indicate to Richard that you wish for non-alcoholic wine, that's there. And we also have uh, other bread, of course, as usual. That's wonderful. So you are very welcome to the Lord's table. So please do come. The music, uh, sorry, the music uh, is going to be played uh, through once. Who's going to play the song through once, and then we want you all to join in after that.
So we say together, Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Now we come to uh, our notices, our family news. First of all, it's a privilege to read a, another set of Bounds of Marriage. So um, I published the Bounds of Marriage between Joel Oliver Basil Court of this parish and Elizabeth Grace Barry, also of this parish. This is for the first time of asking if any of you know any reason in law why they may not marry each other you are to declare it. So let us pray for Joel and Elizabeth. Lord, we pray for Joel and Elizabeth that as they look forward to the day of their marriage, their love for each other will grow deeper and they will know the love you have for them. Amen. Amen. And uh, Francis wants to uh, remind us about the Christian Aid quiz evening. Thank you, Richard. Uh, this Friday at Wesley Road Methodist Church, we've got our annual quiz to raise funds for Christian Aid. It's at half past seven, it's three pound a head, and for that you will also get tea or coffee and cake. And either come as a team of four or join a team when you get there. Uh, it's not me you contact. There's a, the, all the details are in the news sheet on the second page, in, on the inside page. You either ring Kate Rainbow on the name, name, the number that's given, or email her. I hope I'll see some James faces there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francis. It's good that uh, we're getting back to, to normal, isn't it? And uh, another step towards normality is that tomorrow, Keith, um, Kath, and Phil, their house group is going to be meeting again. Uh, they're going to be meeting at 2.15 at uh, their house in 16 Farley Avenue, so do join them there tomorrow if you can. The uh, store, uh, Storehouse Food Bank want us to know how grateful they are for the harvest gifts which were brought to church last week. Um, they, they filled two great big supermarket trolleys which Anne and her husband took over to the uh, storehouse. There's always a note in the, the newsletter about what's needed, so do keep bringing something each week if you can to put in the box at the back of the church. If uh, you think back two years ago, we had a great big green wheelie bin in the church here, and we were supporting the Wiltshire Police knife pre prevention operation at that time, and they were collecting here and elsewhere knives to be handed in. Well, they'd like to do that again this year, starting uh, on the uh, 15th of November. Um, and they, we'd have the, the bin in the church for, for two weeks. But we can only do this, obviously, if we can have the, the church stewarded during that time. So what we'd like to propose is, uh, if we can support this, we open the church Monday to Friday between 12 and 2 for two hours, and then on Saturday, for another two hours, that time between 10 and 12. <coughs> and not only is it the opportunity to have the church open to collect the knives, um, but also an opportunity to have the church open again here in the middle of Trowbridge for people to come in as they used to do for, for coffee and, and word and maybe to pray. So there is a, a rotor at the back of the church, plenty of blank spaces on it. So if you uh, could subscribe to that, uh, this week and next week, we can then give an indication to the, uh, to the local police um, how we can support them. Uh, there will be other churches in the large towns of Wiltshire who will also be joining in this scheme, which is a real service to the community. Um, 
Something to um, pick up from the, the door is the Kadoogly newsletter. John is the uh, deanery representative and he keeps in close touch with what's happening in Kadoogly in the Sudan. So do please pick up um, copies on, on the way out there by the door. Uh, next Sunday, here and in Kivel, we have morning prayer. And again, a, another speaker um, who's not known to us, or maybe, maybe some of us, Steve Hutchinson, who is um, representing this, the Scripture Union, which uh, is one of our charities that we support uh, during the year. So uh, he will be preaching, and it will be the opportunity to, uh, to make a gift to uh, Scripture Union. So the blue envelopes will be out. Thank you. And so we come to our last hymn. And it's a hymn of awe for the gift that Jesus has poured out for us, his life. A gift we can never repay. Love so amazing, so divine demands my soul, my life, my all. Let's stand to sing. blessing upon us. The peace of God which passes all our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and all those whom you love in your hearts and in your homes this day and for evermore. Amen. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.